Yeah, so I mean, um, one of the things I had pulled up here was, um, so one of the things that exists is there is uh, a developer board section on the RISC-V website. So if you go to RISC-V.org, uh, there is a developer boards page. Um, and there's a program where you can participate. Um, you can join the program to get access to boards um, free of cost um, if there's a project that you want to work on. Um, so this is a great thing to do if you're um, if you want to get some hardware um, and uh, work on a project that's of interest. You know, for example, like um, upstreaming a piece of software that you're working on, open source uh, piece of software on the RISC-V architecture. So there's several different boards listed on here um, that have been offered in the past. And let's see if there's any that are open right now. It doesn't look like there's any open right now, but uh, from time to time, new boards show up in here. Oh, actually, sorry, here's the one right now. So, yeah, I believe he has some banana pies, but I was speaking with them uh, last week. Yeah, so you can actually go on this. Uh, if you go to risk5.org and go to the developer board section, um, you can actually apply here um, to get one of the banana pie boards. So this says, eight uh, Linux capable cores. Um, so kind of the idea here is like, let's say you're an open source developer and you wanna uh, port your project to the risc architecture, you can apply here and then um, you get to send the port and kind of the idea is that you then um, uh, write up the things that you've done, like I've ported this project to risc V or um, added support for risc V architecture to something you're working on. So we were kind of waiting for uh, people to show up since we're concurrent to lunch. So, and I know the queues were very long, so uh, I'll, I'll pull up the beginning slide here. But the question was, uh, someone was interested about what boards are available. Um, so I went to the RISC-V website here. Um, so a uh, resource to always pay attention to is riskv.org. Um, kind of everything is linked to from there. Um, isn't there a dev boards uh, area too, like in the exchange? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's the RISC V exchange on the website as well, which is kind of a, a directory of hardware, software, um, hardware design, like cores and, and services. Um, so you can find a lot of things on here. So like if we select hardware, yeah, so we can see. Um, so one of the things I work on, I'm part of the BeagleBoard.org uh, foundation. So we have um, some of the our boards listed on here, but um, a whole range of different boards are listed on here. Um, some of them are, Linux capable cores, um, like the Beagle 5 ahead board with this Alibaba SOC that's Linux case capable. Some of the other ones are just uh, microcontroller boards. Um, so might be running like bare metal code or Zephyr or things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, if you just go to riskv.org and then you click on the RISC V exchange, um, you can see it on there. So let me. One thing yeah. that's been very interesting recently is the, uh, there's a, a new laptop Yeah. Uh, they, they famously just gave one to Linus at the Linux Five Summit China. But um, it is a, I think it's eight cores and up to 16 gigs of memory. And it's actually it's quite performant. There you go. Yeah, so that, that has the same, uh, on the dev boards website we are looking at right now, you can go to the developer boards program from RISC-V International, and you can sign up um, to get one of these banana pie boards. So that has an SOC from, from a company called Space MIT. Space MIT. Um, so that same SOC, that eight core RISC-V chip is also in this uh, uh, laptop from uh, Deep Computing called the DC Roma. Um, is there a microphone? So. Uh, there, should be, there should be a hand mic somewhere. Maybe there isn't. No. Mm -hmm. I'll, have, I can just I'll repeat any. Uh... Oh, here. I think they're going to uh, bring it down. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, anybody have any questions? That you want? Yeah. Uh, so I guess now we've got a few people here. I know the queues were long for lunch. So. Um, and it's during lunch also. So kind of uh, one of the reasons that we're doing the BOFs during lunch is normally the Middle East Conference is three days. It's only two days this time. So we're making up the lost day trying to do some things during lunch, uh, like the birds with a feather. So if you've not been to a BOF or a birds with a feather before, it's just meant to be a discussion session. So I have a few slides, but it's mainly meant to be interactive um, for this to, to discuss uh, all things risk five. Um, so it's kind of a funny name, but it basically just a group discussion. So. Uh, 
Jeffro over here has the mic, so if you want to say something, uh, just raise your hand. He can bring the mic to you. Um, so I'm Drew Festini. I'm a Linux kernel developer at Tenstorrent. Uh, we make uh, high-performance RISC-V cores and, and AI accelerators, and um, Jeffro is with uh, Red Hat, and also you're also part of uh, the RISE organization as yes. well, right? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm the outreach coordinator for the RISE project, which is, uh, we'll go over that in yep. just a few minutes, and uh, I'm also on the RISC-V board. Okay. Uh, and oops. So, uh, what is Risk Five? So, many of you chose to come here during lunch, so you probably have heard the name before. Uh, but Risk Five itself is is an instruction set architecture, so similar to ARM or x86. Um, but in this case, it's an open uh, instruction set architecture, which ultimately that just means that the specifications for the ISA are available under an open source license. It's a Creative Commons license. Um, so. Essentially, we're just talking about the definition of the instruction set being an open specification, which means anyone that wants to can implement it. Um, so we actually have uh, both open source implementations of RISC-V, so there's open source cores, um, but there's also a lot of proprietary cores offered from commercial companies that uh, provide support. So you might have heard of like Sci-Fi or Andes or Alibaba T-Head. Um, those are all companies that are providing cores and, and do commercial support for them. Um, and at this point, so RISC-V itself started at UC Berkeley all the way back in 2010. Um, and over the years, there's been a many universities have gotten involved. Um, there's many companies using it now as well. Um, so there's a pretty good uh, ecosystem of open source projects and commercial software that are supported on RISC-V. Um, so actually, if you're, if you're curious about details, one of the great things to go to is riskv.org. So yeah, if you're wondering, is it, is it risk five, is it risk five, risk V? The V is a Roman numeral five because it was the fifth risk instruction set to come out of Berkeley. So um, you can say risk V, you can say risk five, um, but usually people say risk five. Um, so you can find pretty much everything we're talking here today off of the riskv.org website. Um, so it started in 2010, but uh, it's been 14 years later. There's a kind of a critical mass now of support, I would say, for it in, in many open source projects. Um, I don't know, did you want to say anything about the business uh, side of things? No, I think you got it. Okay. Pretty much covered. <laughs> All right. Um, so there's, there's also many companies that uh, you can see here on the riskv.org website. There's the listing of the members. Um, there's thousands of, comp uh, thousands of members now, maybe... Uh, Several hundred uh, commercial companies. I that believe, are members. yeah, there's an, on the order of 600 companies or 700 companies, and um, about actually Andrea might know um, about 3,500 individual members. Okay. Individual membership doesn't cost anything. Yes, and an important thing to note is um, so some of you may be part of companies like I am. That's it's a corporate member of Risk Five International, but you as an individual can join as a member free of cost. Um, and then that allows you to fully participate um, in the various technical working groups and the mailing lists um, and, and things like that. So I uh, definitely recommend if you're interested in Risk Five, uh, become a, you can click on the membership button up here. And uh, for an individual person, it's free of cost to join. Um, so let's jump ahead here. Um, so uh, there's a really good open source ecosystem. I mean, part of, so, one of the problems if you're using a proprietary ISA, like let's say, you know, X86, which has a lot of weird like co-licensing deals and there's not that many companies that have the right to do X86. And then with ARM, like anyone, most companies, if you want to, you could probably get uh, licenses from ARM, but you can't do an open source implementation of ARM because that would violate the, the terms. So open source is pretty natural to go along with RISC-V because it is an open specification. So um, there's the open HW group or open hardware group. And they're really trying to focus on this, this idea. So you do have open source hardware implementations like open source cores in various uh, IP modules or peripherals. Um, but how do you take those and actually use those in a commercial design? Because it costs lots of money to get a chip made. And if you have mistakes in it, you might end up with something that doesn't work at all. So Open Hardware Group is trying to come up with ways to kind of uh, validate and give confidence that you can use these open source blocks. Because um, like unlike an open source software library, you know, if there's a problem in the open source uh, chip implementation you're using, um, oh, 
I have to say, I have notifications on. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you might be out of luck. So, uh, and then one of the things I'm involved in, so uh, I'm part of the BeagleBoard.org Foundation. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization that's making um, open source hardware uh, dev boards. So you might have seen the BeagleBone or the BeagleBoard. We have a couple Risk Five boards now, um, with uh, one with a microchip. Uh, SOC and uh, from the Microchip Com Corporation, another one from uh, Alibaba T Head, um, and then there's the Chips Alliance. So they're they're taking a kind of a different route from Open Hardware Group. Uh, they're all Open Hardware Group's all about validating the IP and making it reliable, and so you can drop it into your design and have confidence. Chips Alliance is trying to get bring together people that are working on um, both open source tooling for. Um, silicon design and FPGA design, and also different things other than just the processor core, so things like interconnects and other pieces of like a modern SOC. Um, so there's, there's many, many hardware providers that are doing, uh, a lot of them are doing like uh, processor cores, so Sci-5, Andes, um, they both offer, um, uh, and Alibaba T had, they all offer commercial RISC V cores that you can license, um, and then Many of these large companies that you probably have heard of, like NVIDIA, they're using RISC-V cores in their GPUs for power management and security. So, I mean, they're not running the, uh, the graphic side of things, but they're running like uh, the parts of the chip to manage the chip, uh, like little cores in there. Um, so there's a whole host of companies um, that are working on things. Um, and then there's also many like uh, software service companies, there, consultancies like Ant Micro, um, that you can come to them and, and help create solutions. Um, and then most importantly, I think uh, RISC-V has really become very successful in university environments. So um, it came out of Berkeley 14 years ago, but for example, ETH Zurich, uh, they're doing many interesting things with, with, with RISC-V. Um, they have uh, a whole range of open source processor cores that they've designed. Um, and some of those have even been, are being used now in commercial designs. Um, but uh, it, now that more people are showing up, so this is meant to be a birds of a feather or a boff, which is just a discussion session. So um, if there's any comments or questions, uh, just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. So kind of the whole idea here is it's meant to be interactive. Uh, so, you know, we just have like one more slide. So uh, hopefully we'll get a good discussion going here. Um, so the software ecosystem, um, I would say it's pretty mature now in RISC-V, especially for open source uh, projects. So many of the distros you've heard of, Linux distros, they now have, most of them have un unofficial RISC-V releases. Um, the next stable release of Debian will have RISC-V support officially. Um, one of the constraints there is that there's not really any high performance server hardware yet for RISC-V. So that's kind of holding back uh, distros like Fedora that want to do like full native builds in like a, a, a data center environment. Um, but, uh, you know, there's support in distros and I would say like tool chains, um, LLVM, Clang, and GCC have had support for a long time. Um, you know, support is in Linux, KVM uh, for, for RISC-V. Um, a lot of work ends up being done on QMU because hardware, especially for high performance systems that would be running Linux, um, there's, there's companies working on it, but there's not a lot of hardware out there yet. So oftentimes when we're working on support in things like Linux kernel, we're working on QMU. Um, and uh, yeah, there's kind of a whole array of things that are uh, running on RISC-V now, especially in the open source ecosystem. And so one of the things that has kind of uh, lagged behind a bit in RISC-V, mainly because RISC-V in itself is a specification for an instruction set architecture, basically like uh, a contract under which you write the, uh, you know, implement the instruction set that software is going to use. Uh, software kind of lagged behind a bit. So one of the ways to address this was an organization started last year, uh, kind of I think May of last year, May of 2023, uh, trying to bring different companies together and put effort behind uh, different areas of the software ecosystem for RISC-V. So the way that it's organized is uh, there's different WGs, which are work groups. So there's uh, groups for uh, compilers and tool chains, um, firmware, uh, distro integration, uh, kernel and virtualization. So kind of Linux kernel and also KVM. Um, and then also trying to get things like various languages and runtimes working well in RISC-V. 
I would say like many things are supported on RISC-V, but they're not necessarily optimized. So a lot of the work that RISE is doing is trying to optimize things that uh, different software projects that, uh, you know, they might be uh, able to compile and run on RISC-V, but they've not been tuned appropriately yet. Um, so let me take a, let's uh, pull up the RISE website here. So this is the website for RISE, and there's a public wiki that kind of lists all the things that are going on. And kind of one of the key uh, things behind RISE is it's just trying to coordinate the member companies to work, uh, to identify gaps and then work on the upstream software projects. So there isn't like any code repos or anything like that hosted by RISE. Uh, the, everything's, you know, either working upstream in Linux kernel or working upstream in uh, U-Boot or EDK2 or whatever the um, associated upstream software project is for that. Oh, here, I already got it pulled up here. So depending on what area you're interested in, um, you know, you can check out the different work groups here. So I'm, I'm a Linux kernel developer. So if I go take a look at the kernel work group, you can see the different priorities. Um, so we're in the second half of 2024 now. So these are the things that uh, the companies involved in RISE are focused on uh, adding support for, um, you know, into Linux kernel and other projects like um, U-Boot and, and EDK2 for ACPI-based systems, KVM as well for virtualization. Um, so if you're interested in this, you can kind of dig into all the details there on the wiki because it's all uh, public. Let's flip back over to the science here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the end of the slide. So does anyone have any uh, questions or comments? Um, otherwise, I can pull up some other resources on the risk5.org website. Yeah. Sorry, I have a very few knowledge about the risk five, so my question is basic. Uh, do you have uh, any number about the, let's say, um, uh, presence of risk five uh, chip solution, for example, in the IoT market, uh, respect to ARM and other solution, just to have. Uh, an idea of how the risk five uh... yeah i would say so um risk five has uh you see it a lot now in that lower end sort of microcontroller class so um i would say it's it's become quite successful in that area a little bit less so in the higher performance uh, like system on chip uh market um but yeah there, there's a lot on there and um i think we talked about this before while people were coming in but uh, if we go to riskv.org, um, there's a thing at the top there called the Risk Five Exchange, um, and on there there's a whole directory of both hardware and software and different things. So if we take a look at the hardware there, um, you know, we can see uh, a lot of different systems on here. The majority of which are kind of more microcontroller or IoT class. Uh, far fewer like uh, capable of running a full operating system like Linux. Um, so you can take a look on here, uh, and uh, many of them are, uh, you know, microcontrollers, so meant to be more for like IoT applications and things like that. Okay. And I have another question is uh, um, regarding the, the point of view of a final user, so let's say a company which, which uh, has to manufacture a product and to select a chip. So uh, I mean, uh, if I select uh, an ARM, let's say a Cortex M0, M4, I know uh, that is uh, has some uh, characteristic specific. Um, I would like to, to understand if uh, on the RIX-5 uh, uh, side, uh, the, the how, um, let's say, the, the, the um, how, the, 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 how the, the producer can uh, have an idea of uh, the, um, the comparison between several products of several companies. I, it's uh, a little bit confused, sorry, but uh, I yeah. mean, uh, from the architecture point of view. Yeah, I mean, like you're thinking about like if you're, if you're a company and you're looking to create a device in terms of evaluating different, like you yeah. might be looking at, ARM Cortex, uh, various ARM Cortex cores. Um, so I mean, the, the different companies that, um, so let's go up to the top here on the RISC-V exchange um, and we can select cores. Um, so there are 
open, there are open source projects that have created cores, but there's also a lot of companies that are offering cores. So um, some of the main ones are um, uh, Sci-5 and Andes. Let me go back to the main page here. So many of the top, uh, top member companies of the RISC-V Foundation are, are doing that. So um, like Sci-5 and, and Alibaba, T-Head and Andes, uh, Imagination, I think um, also Synopsys, they're all offering uh, RISC-V cores. And as part of that, they have like a whole range of, of uh, offerings similar to what ARM does. So depending on your application, you know, you can, you can go to like, if you go to Sci-5, for example, or you go to Andes, you can see a whole kind of array of different cores they offer. Now that would be for someone that's looking to design their own chip. Um, now in terms of companies that are offering like risk, uh, offering fully formed chips, like a microcontroller or something like that, um, there are also companies that are doing that as well. Um, so like, uh, for example, um, there is, um, some of you might be familiar with this, is Wi-Fi capable microcontroller um, from a company called Espressif. So there's the ESP, uh, uh, one of the ESP line of uh, microcontrollers has RISC-V cores in them now. So um, you're seeing them more and more in microcontrollers that are offered from various companies. Um, especially if you look at the uh, kind of the premier members of the RISC-V Foundation, um, some of them are, you know, starting to have microcontrollers that are RISC-V based, you know, th the sorts of things you might see in IoT applications. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll bring the microphone to you. I should say um, the RISC-V Foundation does have uh, um, summits. Uh, so they have one usually in the spring or summer in Europe. I think it was in Munich back in June and coming, in, uh, coming up in October. Uh, we're pretty far away from there, but there's going to be one in October in California in the USA. Uh, and there's also one that happens in China, which I think happened recently, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So wherever you are in the world, there will probably be a RISC-V International, RISC-V Summit uh, event there. Um, yeah, go ahead. Hi there. Um, you mentioned NVIDIA as a prominent example yeah. and uh, that they use RISC-V on kind of complementary chips uh, yeah. on their GPUs. Just for dummies like me, please explain what is um, the benefit of using an open architecture. Like I have some yeah. guesses, but I'm super yeah. interested. Yeah, I recall one of the hardware designers from NVIDIA gave a presentation at the RISC-V Summit several years ago. Um, one of the nice things is R the RISC-V Foundation has a YouTube channel. So all these different summits that happen around the world, they have all the talks on there. So there is one from an NVIDIA engineer a few years ago. Um, so for them, they were, um, Many of these companies already have their own proprietary instruction set architectures um, for all these little like uh, scattered around little tiny cores on any of these bigger chips. Um, so for them, they said one, it was, um, you know, the freedom to implement the micro architecture. So you have the instruction set architecture, but then how you design that into a, into a, a core, which is the micro architecture, they had the freedom to do that, how, what was best for their application. So you mentioned one was uh, they were able to get like the um, area that it took up on the chip smaller than with the previous instructions that they were using. They were also able to have it use less power. So for them, like both the, the size on the chip, uh, the area and the power both were lower than what they were using uh, previously. Um, and there was another example from a uh, one of the engineers from Sci-5, I saw a talk a few years ago. And uh, if you look at any of these modern system on chips or anything big like a GPU or something like that, um, they usually have like a whole, like maybe 10 or more instruction sets because they have all these little coprocessors on them. So one of the other advantages of companies adopting RISC-V is then you just have like one instruction set for all these different little cores, which on the software side of things, then you don't have to have uh, teams supporting all these different compilers. You could just either use the open source compiler, or just maintain one internally for that one instruction set architecture and not have to have, uh, you know, a bunch of different ones for all these different uh, cores in the chip. Sure. I would also just add that that also means that uh, every single one of those processors would require a royalty from ARM. And if you are using RISC-V, there is no royalty attached. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, Hill, uh, so you mentioned that you are working on the accelerators, hardware accelerators that yes. are based on RISC-V. Yeah. So I'm interested in the state of, let's say, GPU or AI acceleration uh, when it comes to RISC-V. I've scanned a little bit the ecosystem I saw Vortex GPU, 
that seems to be quite advanced. Uh, are there some other uh, like implementation that do you know maybe what state it is in and uh, can it be used in uh, real, you know, production, commercial production? Uh, so let me give a yeah. background. Uh, so I'm asking this because I'm uh, working with, uh, on the trusted execution environments and the confidential computing. Okay. Uh, so we've been examining a Keystone project from RISC V, and uh, uh, currently there is only NVIDIA GPU H100 that is the newest one that implements trusted execution environments. Uh, uh, so there is an opportunity. Uh, you know, eventually to, to try to mimic this or to build something similar. And so I'm wondering how, uh, like, how, how difficult would it be from your perspective and also because it is related to the virtualization, yeah, uh, yeah. which seems to be your background. So can you elaborate yeah. on this um, as well? So there are um, several companies that are working on more data center focused offerings. So uh, Ventana and Revos and several other companies where um, virtualization is important for those workloads. Um, and they've been leading some of the different, so the way RISC-V, the way, the way these specifications get created is there's different uh, technical groups working on different types of specifications. And then they're organized under committees. So there is like one for security and underneath that there are several different specifications. So things like uh, confidential computing and trusted execution environments, there is a, several groups that are working on that. Um, and they have created some specifications. Now those are just the specifications and then there's different companies that are doing implementation. So I think for example, like uh, Sci-5 I think has uh, um, in terms of if you're uh, designing a chip and you want to integrate these things, I think they have um, like some of these different RISC-V IP vendors like Sci-5 and Andes. Uh, I think they offer uh, solutions for those sorts of things. Um, there's also uh, Proof of concepts that are done is like open source as well. Um, you'd also act about like GPU as well. Um, so there is a group in RISC V International. So I, I brought up the wiki here, which is wiki.riscv.org. Um, and underneath there, you can see all these different technical groups that are coming up to these specifications. There is a group that's focused on trying to come up with uh, applying RISC V extensions uh, to do GPU type things. So. I think it's still pretty early on in that. Like, I, I don't know of any like hardware that actually implements this to do like a GPU, but on Risk Five. But um, there are people working on a specification for that, and I think probably the realm in which they're working on right now is probably like FPGAs, um, where they're you can you can put the design into a chip, but it's not you know as efficient or cost effective as it would be as uh, making an ASIC. Um, now, in terms of accelerators, I would say that's one of the big drivers. So you have a lot of microcontrollers, IoT type devices that are using RISC V, but then RISC V on higher performance systems, it often comes into play in accelerators. So like the company I work for and some of the other uh, members of uh, RISC V International, um, they're really focused on accelerating certain type of workloads like um, you know, deep neural networks, things like that. So the advantage with RISC V is they can take the RISC V instruction set and implement and kind of add to it what they need. So the original reason that RISC V was created back in 2010 is the researchers at Berkeley were doing uh, research into uh, vector um, vector processing, and they but they needed an instruction set to add that capability onto. Um, so I didn't really talk about it in here, but. Uh, one of the kind of design goals of RISC-V was to make it modular and extensible. So um, all these different groups are working on adding new specifications that uh, unlock those sorts of applications. So there's a vector extension, which is actually can be quite useful for um, machine learning kernels and things like that. Um, there's also one being worked on for matrix now, which is also comes into play with um, high performance computing and, and also certain uh, kernels that you might run for uh, machine learning as well. Um, I'm running off of some assumptions now, so stop me if I'm getting something fundamentally wrong. But I imagine that um, software that is very specialized will benefit the most from um, adapting to RISC-V and fully utilize this instruction set. 
but specialized software is often kind of niche, I imagine, yeah. uh, compared to whatever typewriter program. So my question is, where in this Venn diagram, how, how large is the intersection of software that is so specialized that it benefits greatly? Um, and also, or I'm going to have to rephrase, how many programs um, um, benefit to a level that justifies the cost of adapting to Risk Five? Yeah, so one of the challenges on the software side with Risk Five is it's, it's this really extensible and modular instruction set, but then if you're compiling software, like for example, think of like a binary distribution, um, like Debian or something like that, you know, they're gonna compile binaries and those binaries are going to be using certain instructions or not using certain instructions. So how do you decide like what to compile your binaries for, especially something like a Linux distro where like, for binary distributions like Debian, like people aren't gonna recompile all the packages uh, for like the given piece of hardware you have. So like uh, the way that RISC-V International has been trying to, to deal with that problem is the idea of profiles. Um, so there's a combinatorial explosion of all these different extensions that you can combine together. But the idea with profiles is for certain markets or certain application areas, like these are the extensions that are required. These are the extensions that are optional. Um, so then in things like tool chains, like GCC or, or Clang, LLVM, you can like say, okay, I'm gonna use this profile or that profile. Um, and then on top of that, there's an additional idea of platforms that kind of brings other standardization along with that for different classes. So right now, up for public review right now, which is the last stage before it gets ratified, is we have two profiles right now. One's called RVA for binary uh, compatible applications. So these would be things like, you know, uh, a full Linux distribution, a full Linux distribution, uh, binary distribution, and like, you know, essentially like um, for, for ARM64 and also for x86, you know, these uh, Linux distros target like certain sets of those ISAs. Um, and, you know, maybe for x86 over the years, we've maybe had three or four uh, ABIs that have the distros have targeted. Um, ARM, I don't know, maybe one or two. So similar idea with Risk Five is we need to say like this is what the ABI that we're going to be building, you know, Fedora or Debian for. Um, and then the big thing in that is like they're not going to use all of the extensions. Um, and uh, there may be a really interesting extension that comes out is defined next year, and then maybe two years later there's chips that are using it. But then when you decide to have the binary uh, distributions, you know, um, change their ABI to make use of that. So the idea there is to use profiles um, and platforms, which are these specifications that Risk Five International is introducing. Um, but that's it's still kind of in flux a bit. Um, so I think like one of the places you'll probably see a lot of discussion on that is if you go to the Risk Five uh, YouTube channel for the Risk Five Summit videos, both from the ones earlier this year and the one that's happening next month. Um, there'll be a lot of discussion around profiles. Uh, for example, Android. So Google uh, announced, I think it was last year, that they're going to be doing a, a, a chip with Qualcomm that's meant to run Android. Um, and one of the key things there is, um, what will the ABI be? What, what uh, instructions will they have their uh, binaries using? Um, so they're being very thoughtful about what to include, what uh, extensions to the ISA to include in there, um, and which ones to not require. Because once the Android ABI is defined, like it's going to be like that for a very long time. Because you have you know developers producing these applications, these apps, and they're not going to be recompiling them all constantly, right? So uh, getting the ABI right for something like Android is, is a really important thing. Um, so it, it's uh, still kind of in development. So um, you know, uh, definitely, I would say uh, check out the Risk Five Summit talks, and the, the, there's usually be discussion about that. Thanks, Drew. Uh, question about the Yocto project. <coughs> you know, yep. the LTS that we released um, in uh, April doesn't have support for Risk Five yet. Uh, though there was some code from the community, but there's no apparently no member big enough to fund yes. the support for this architecture. Why is is this not happening yet? Yeah. Did you want to speak about that? Or, Question. Uh, no, I don't okay. want to speak about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, I'm not part of Yocto project, uh, so, or, or uh, you know, I'm not uh, in the leadership of RISE or any of these sorts of things. So my impression is basically what the Yocto project needs is they need a company to join at the platinum level. I think a platinum, right? Um, because yes. in order to add an architecture to something like Yocto, it requires resources like servers and also people to fix bugs. So, mm -hmm. for example, like um, if there is no one that's 
there's no funding for risk five officially uh, for something like Octo, then who's going to look at like a risk five bug that's breaking the build and, and then no one gets their new release of Yocto because of that. So um, I'm hopeful that the companies that are using um, the companies that are using Yocto for their product offerings, like there might be risk five vendors that are pointing their customers to Yocto as, as a thing that they can run their chips. Hopefully one of those companies will step up and become a platinum member and then it can become an official architecture in Yocto. What I would also like to very much see is multiple companies because there are many companies that depend on both Yocto, both depend on Yocto and are very interested in risk five development. Um, what the Yocto project needs is multiple projects to join or multiple companies to join to add up to that same amount of money. So it doesn't have to be one company coming in with uh, a platinum membership at $150,000 a year. It could be three memberships at 50 or five memberships at 30 or 25 or whatever it is. And um, they're basically just suffice it to say there are a lot, there are, there are lobbying efforts going on, maybe sometimes in hidden corners. So we're definitely working on it. Thank you, and thank you for bringing it up. This did come up also in the, uh, the same buff at uh, Open Source Summit in yeah. Seattle. And, and last time I did a RISC-V BOF, which was uh, in Dublin, it also came up. Yes, so, it comes up yes, on a regular uh, basis. And yeah. it should keep coming up until we solve the problem. Yes. So, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. So for, for a comment, uh, from a point of view of, you know, the, the, the someone providing embedded Linux training, I think, the risk five is kind of refreshment uh, compared to the other popular embedded architecture, which, have a, which has a, too, too many instruction sets, too many features, too many FPUs options, and so on. So for, for risk five, it's uh, the, the, the documentation, the instruction set is very clean. And uh, for a kernel development, I would like to ask what's the pre and st status right now. Yeah, so I, the interesting thing is that a couple architectures, including RISC V, I mean, most notably x86, is there was a patch that I think last week um, that finally turned on preempt RT for some of these architectures. I think the last piece was related to uh, print K and, and console logging. So I, I, I saw a couple of people uh, put a, like a tested by or act by tag on there. So um, I've not tried it on anything yet, but I, I saw a couple of developers um, try it on a risk five. So um, that's exciting. Uh, you know, uh, it's, we've waited very, very long for preempt RT to be something that's just upstream. So, and, and I was excited to see that risk five was included in that series. So uh, yeah, if people are interested, try, try it out on, uh, on the systems that you have. Well, we're, I think we're almost at time since we were supposed to end around 40, but, uh, okay. you know, kind of last call, any, any more questions or comments? Cool. Uh, well, I'll just end with, you know, uh, if you're interested in Risk Five, there's a lot of resources on riskv.org. And then especially if, you're, if you want to check out some really interesting talks about Risk Five, check out the YouTube channel, uh, the Risk Five International YouTube channel. There's a, most of the things I've learned about Risk Five have been from that, that YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thanks for coming and uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks.